Welcome to a Whirly Bear Productions podcast with me, Amber Williams. We explore film finance and distribution, featuring insights from filmmakers, entertainment lawyers, and industry experts. Hello, and welcome to part two of our episode dedicated to Ben and Suzanne, a reunion in four parts with writer, producer, and director, Sean Sarah Ratney, and producer, Duranja Paul Mitchell. Duranja Paul Mitchell is a creative architect, actor, writer, and producer. His production company, Thermostat Media, tells innovative, faith-centered, and thought-provoking stories producing for television, film, and theater. Duran is known for his Broadway role in Aaron Sorkin's To Kill a Mockingbird, opposite Jeff Daniels, and in Latanya Richardson Jackson's directorial debut of The Piano Lesson, starring Samuel Jackson, Danielle Brooks, and John David Washington. Duran serves as a creative producer and script consultant, with clientele ranging from New York, LA, and the greater Southwest region. I know you're gonna love this episode. It's got heaps of useful information. They're brilliant guys and super talented, so enjoy. So, Sean, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. And Doron, welcome to the show. I'm very excited to have you both on. Yes, yes. Uh, excited to be back. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Um, so we will get started. Um, I was hoping you could give us a bit of advice about filmmakers wanting to collaborate on the director-producer level. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. first and foremost, find someone who likes movies. Well, we'll start there. <laughs> I think we have, there's too many situations in which, you know, if you're going to do a collaboration of sorts, um, the like, it's so imperative that you both share a passion in it. Um, otherwise, it doesn't really feel like a collaboration. It feels more like for one person, it's a job and for the other person, it's uh, fun or enjoyable. And so I find the best collaborations producer to director have been engaging with directors who share similar passion in the art. You know, they're not just doing this to be seen. And likewise, on my side, you know, you're not just doing this to make money, you know? Yeah, I think <laughs> echoing that, I think uh, shared values is mm -hmm. really important. So it's like, it's the movies, but this is what's so cool about working with Duran is he has a, a compass and he has uh, his own individual purpose for why he does what he does. Um, and for those things to be aligned is so critical to know that like we have a certain attitude towards things. Like we're both interested in not doing things in the same way or traditional way or like how can we disrupt spaces and being very aligned with that I think is really, really important. And definitely like there are producers out there that are not interested in movies. They're not really into movies. So, um, I mean, the first conversation Duran and I, we met um, at a party. Um, our actor in the film, Sathya, uh, was just uh, premiered on Broadway in Life of Pi. And um, we met for the first time over there and we just started having conversations about romantic comedies, French New Wave, uh, ways we see masculinity in film, what are other ways of making a movie. And so like already from that first conversation, and that was just us meeting as friends, you know, we're just at a party and just having conversation. And I think that's where it also needs to start with is like, not from like, a, oh, I'm looking for this and I'm looking for this. It's like, we're just really getting to know each other as people. Um, I think that's really important. And something that I learned throughout this process, too, is how to really let somebody in into the process. Um, and I think that's another really important aspect of the director producer relationship. You know, I've gotten so used to producing a lot of things like my previous short films, um, not all of them, but a lot of them I've done on my own. And so I have got, had gotten into this uh, way of operating. It's like, OK, cool. Like, I kind of know how to do this and do that. And um it was through this relationship where I learned that there is a partner. And then that's what a great producer is, is your partner from the beginning to the end. But for a partnership to grow, whatever things that like as an individual you might have been holding on to, you need to open it up and you need to let them in. And it needs to be this shared thing. And um, that was something I learned throughout this project. And uh, it's it's amazing when you do that because then it really feels like you have your partner um, for for the journey and it is a journey. And so I think, yeah, there's, there's shared values and then really like understanding what the partnership is. And one thing that uh, 
we had conversations about too is like what are expectations what are responsibilities and being kind of clear with it because i think the more amorphous things are that's when it could feel as if oh okay is this my thing is this his thing like who's tackling this and i think just being really clear about what we're doing what the responsibilities are what uh we're tackling individually um is so important to have these conversations and i think that's what leads to a really great director producer relationship so there's so many factors uh at it but yeah i'm summarizing myself for the third time but you get the idea <laughs> yeah i can imagine it would be really difficult to let go like of that creative control so i can understand why you yeah. need to be able to trust each yeah. other For sure. And it's not um, and it's not even the always the, the creative control, because I think with a great producer and like working with Duran, it's there's the understanding of like you're the writer and director and a great producer is coming to to help build that vision in a way that's going to make sense and be effective and uh, efficient and successful. Um, and so I think that's another thing, because there are producers then that um kind of want to steer the ship as a director and so like understand maybe some directors want that relationship right so like understanding like exactly what that is too you know so it's like being aligned on the creative side of things um uh but yeah it's like it's there's the creative collaboration but then there's the collaboration of like what it means to put together a project Uh, Duran, I just yeah, want to no. toss it back to you over there. Just no, no, yeah, no, no. any reflections on these points? No, I, I just, I, I, you're summarizing it really well. I've been in this season, um, Amber. I've just been in a season of like, I use a lot of metaphors, so bear with my life. Um, but <laughs> we're about to lose Dan Ashworth to like Man U. I'm a, I'm a big football fan, and I'm a Newcastle fan, kind of born and raised. And we're about to lose Dan Ashworth, and I would describe it like a sporting director. to a manager, right? Like the skipper is the writer director and it's really their job, you know, that's their vision. That's the way you wanna make the team run. You want these players, you know, as a sporting director, it's not really your job to tell the manager how to run the team. And I think a healthy producer is like a really great sporting director. It's my job to scout the right people, kind of keep you in line to like, hey, this is the budget that we have, you know, But at the end of the day, if you, you know, if you run a run of four, four, three, you can run a four, a four, three, three, as long as you want, like, it's fine, you know? Um, so I've just been thinking about different ways to describe like how uh, the producer director relationship is, because I think that the more I'm talking to creatives and, you know, writer directors will reach out with scripts and think, oh, we want you to produce on this. And I think you have to really understand like, what do you want the producer to do versus because I think that word producer can mean so many things mm. uh, and I think that's the big danger is like writer director both of those terms like right both of those terms even actor like they all mean what they mean whereas a producer at times at the end of the day me going to get you uh you know chips for the freaking shoot Like that's a producer, like, you know what I mean? Same as, oh, I booked this venue for the concert, also producer, you know, so expectations and making it really clear about like, if you're bringing on a, you know, a, kind of like an executive producer or creative producer, like the ways that I serve in a role, it's like my job is to always, and I said this to Sean, we first met, you know, my job is to see the writer director's vision come to pass in a way that is um, the clearest for them. You know, it's not my job to create their vision. Um, it's my job to say, okay, given your vision, how can we do that in a way that is clear, coherent to both an audience and to yourself, you know? Uh, Duran had a great, uh, we met for uh, coffee last week and he had a great um, description of like the four corners of what producing is. I think that could be a helpful thing to share because I think that really sort of like breaks the, you know, what the producing bucket could be and like the different types of producers that exist and how many different aspects of the quadrant we tap into. Um, Duran, I'd love for you to share that because I think that could be super informative for listeners. Yeah, I'll give you, um, I'll give you the headings of it as I, I'm working on a book right now. So I'll give you the headings of it and all of your listeners can stay tuned for when I actually release the book on it. 
so that you know <laughs> copyright infringement anyway yeah. no, i'm just kidding uh the four yes yeah, so the four corners of producing it's think of it like a rectangle um and on that on those four corners you have a um creative producer um you have a uh fiscal producer you have a physical producer and you have a philosophical producer and the idea of those four corners if we were looking at it like this um oh that's cool you can see it all self in the room. oh that's cool um creative producer handles everything from you know cast crew or a cast um works really closely with the director on the script has a real understanding of the artistic vision right those are the kind of producers who get geeked out about you know page two page four page whatever um you have physical producers uh physical production is hirings of crew people who are really organized in the way of like timesheets and insurance and making sure that like we're in on the right time and we're out at the right time you know these typically handle payroll um they're just like again there are people who are like product management then you have fiscal producers or financial producers those are you know at the end of the day people who really enjoy the money of it so whether it's bringing in capital raising capital uh networking uh brand sponsorships and and just the idea of like the money flow section of it uh and then you have philosophical producers and those are people who deal with things like brand marketing exposure publicity um how does this project relate to the greater writer director at large like is this a franchise piece is this a web series is this um is the goal of making this to really go go to a marvel movie whatever it is and so you find that the creative producer and the physical um philosophical producer kind of live on top of the square and the physical producer and the fiscal producer are kind of in that baseline you know getting things done versus in the air having visions and ideas and that the writer director is in the center um and that it's the job of the writer director to understand that there are spaces and avenues that they can play in but they don't live in any one of those so yeah that was cool i enjoyed that so when is the book coming out where are you at with that and tell us more about it well we started we started the book um top of the year uh when it started to seem like you know as an actor as well i'm a creative architect like the journey to producing started to kind of take off and i started realizing i should like notate some of these like tips and tricks and things that really i find really like high 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 level producers have all developed over time but never really shared either with other people or you know it's a lot of like yeah and then you just do it um and i didn't really like that so it was really my wife who was like hey will you start writing that stuff down and so we'll see i think it'll probably i'll have the first pass of it uh end of 2025 at this rate um because it's the goal is not to create a like this is how produ like the bible of producing but rather um i would say more like a quick template of like how you can understand the philosophy of producing um so yeah that's I think great that's a necessary yeah, book. Let us know. Yeah, yeah it is for yeah sure. share the knowledge absolutely no gatekeepers just bridge makers mm -hmm. <laughs> ah that's beautiful um and so i want to talk a bit more about your kind of philosophy and um Sean talked a bit about your kind of compass and where you wanted to go how you looked at storytelling so I was looking at another one of your interviews and you said Ben and Suzanne is like independent storytelling from a faith forward standpoint and mm. this is the beginning um this is the future of cinema so I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a bit and just tell us a bit more about that yeah absolutely um I mean, for me, I just believe that we're reaching an apex um, in the entertainment industry in which um, both commerce, brand exposure, uh, individualism, and the concept of like technology are like kind of colliding with each other. And all it took was like AI and a global pandemic to <laughs> make us all go, wait, what are we doing? And is this even sustainable? And so for me, you know, Ben and Suzanne really represented an example of like, what does it look like to have a full-time job and still choose to be a creative 
because you live as a creative. I think the days of people saying things like, I'm just a blank are over. And I think that the reason why is because the quality of that, both the positive and the negative. So oh, I'm just a writer um, or oh, I'm just a filmmaker trying to make it, or I'm just an actor or whatever that phrase is. I think the quality of that has lost its um, uh, romanticism. You know, got like at the end of the day, I, I was doing a play, I was doing the piano lesson on Broadway uh, two years ago, last year and two years ago. And one of the things that I talked to Sam Jackson about, right, was about, you know, how he came up in the industry. You know, gone are the days of, I just did a bunch of like short films or, you know, scrappy downtown plays and built a career because, you know, me and like seven other people were living in this apartment for $250 a month. Like that era is over. And I think the industry knows that, but doesn't necessarily know how to reflect that yet. So we're, we're going to enter a new era of, incredible innovative creators who also happen to be really kick-ass high school teachers or really incredible product management or oh i actually work in fintech and i play guitar or you know i have a piano in the back and i want to start playing so like those kinds of creatives uh having an opportunity to uh what i call like i said faithing forward so making those risks making those steps into making art um and because of you know legends like Soderbergh who continue to show us the innovation of like at the end of the day I'm sitting at a station in my office right now where I could make a movie right here like everything is here to make a film and down to the music down to what the, the really beautiful parts of AI that I like which are like expanding outreach to disenfranchised people to have access to color grading and sound score mixing and all of those things. And so I saw Ben and Suzanne as a real opportunity um, to go back to, well, what are the things about storytelling that I love? There, what are the things about storytelling that I feel this industry really loves? Um, and what are these things about storytelling that audiences gravitate towards? And that's authentic, raw. Um, and I'm, I'm going to say this, and I don't mean it to sound reductive, but uh, just like simple stories, uh, stories that aren't connected to some greater grandiose political message. Um, and I say that with a lot of care because we live in an era right now where polarity is at an all time high. I mean, I'm a black man in America who went through now four different eras of disenfranchising injustice to my people, right? Um, and I remember sitting in my house, living in a New York City, Astoria, Queens, the epicenter of the pandemic and witnessing the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and marching with Mike Brown three years earlier than that and watching an entire world suddenly become awakened to racism in a sort of way. But now I sit in my <laughs> my home uh, post that, I guess, pandemic era on the backs of another war now infiltrating and people and students passionately protesting um, for the disenfranchise and injustice of others. And so as I was saying to my wife, who's first generation Mexican, we live in a world where because of these things, we are so inundated with the, the political, the frustration, the dark, the otherwise gloomy. And I think we've gotten to a place where we've become both numb to it and almost uh, addicted to it. And so our art is reflecting that in a way that every third project has to represent something that is about some oppression or if you're making a project that involves people who are of different races, there's got to be some political undertone or some greater message. Otherwise, you're damned if you do that or, you know, you're cursed if you don't, you know, you're, oh, wow, look at them just making a, a film about two people who love each other and go on a road trip and they're not having a like metaphysical, like metaphysical or philosophical debate about the fact that she's white. Like it comes out in passion because it's humanity, but it's not the meaning of the story. Um, and for me, I felt like here was a great example with Ben and Suzanne. And it's a lot of what a lot of my pieces, uh, projects that I produce, projects that I write, um, projects that I continue to seek to push forward and foster. Uh, I always say my mission statement as a production company, Thermostat Media, is to expand the kingdom of God in an avant-garde way. And I mean that at every core of my being. You know, I believe in fruit-based content because I believe it's universal. I believe that art that talks about love, art that talks about hate, art that talks about 
the value of family, the values of what it means to have true brotherhood, what intimacy really gets to look like, um, all of these various terms and themes, like that's what I think the, the world needs. And I know that that's what the industry is hungry for. And right now, I believe that we're truly at a place where the industry knows that that's what it desires, but it doesn't know how to go about it in a economically efficient um, and dare I say, responsible way. So we're kind of stuck in this neo nostalgia. How can we pull on the films that we we know worked? And it's like, yeah, but what made those things work was that they were authentic, they were original, they were fresh, and they weren't trying to be. Uh, every project doesn't need to be Moonlight. You know, every project doesn't need to be Schindler's List. Um, in order for us to still see the humanity in people, and Ben and Suzanne, I think in the vein of like, you know, the Woody Allens of the world, uh, barring their life choices, but the uh, like the vein of like the Woody Allens of the world or the When Harry Met Sally's of the world, um, the Before Sunrises of the world created a film that every audience member that I've talked to that watched the film has felt like, wow, this is so refreshing. And the second thing that comes out of their mouth is the phrase that I'm looking to dismantle, which is we don't make movies like that anymore. And so that's been really my goal is to like, I'm done hearing people say, man, we don't make movies like that anymore. It's like, so how can I be a part of making movies like that again, you know? That was beautifully put. I enjoyed listening oh, to that. You. Yeah, that was wonderful. Fantastic. Um, I want to ask actually, because so many creatives now, as you say, are wearing so many hats and do have full-time jobs. How do you go? very boring question after all the beautiful things you just said but I think it's really important um how do you go about organizing your day and juggling all those jobs um yeah <laughs> yeah um, uh, go for it so yeah I mean it's it's uh it's not easy um and I think this is where personal mindset is really important because we have our, our job and, you know, the fact of life is we need to bring an income in some way. And um, I, I feel I'm very fortunate to have a job in education where uh, it's uh, idealistic and I get to just uh, share my passion with my students and it's all centered around filmmaking. And then it actually reinforces my thinking on filmmaking and I'm learning new things along the way and how to communicate that and how to articulate the art. But, um, you know, you're working, if you're working a full-time job, you are tired. You know, that is eight hours minimum, maybe, that you are working. And um, then you have to come home and then you also have, you know, your life. You have your partners, you have uh, your friendships and social relationships and hobbies and things you want to do. And um, what can often happen is, you know, you have the full time job and you have the artistic pursuit that you want to do. And then little by little, like that gets pushed to the side. It's like, oh, well, I need to go to this happy hour. I got to hang out. It's this person's birthday. Um, but those things are important, too. Right. Like it's how to have that balance. You know, you there's periods of my life where I was not doing that stuff and I was, you know, turning down offers to socialize and to go out because I'm like, I need to stay home. I need to work on the script. And then sometimes you stay at home to work on the script and you kind of watch TV, <laughs> you know, and then it's like, oh, well, I'm working on the script right now. Right. But I think that's where the personal mindset is super important because it is not. And I mean, that's the case for anything. If you didn't have a job, you still need that personal mindset because now it's on you to produce the thing that you want to do and you're saying you want to do this thing but unless you're taking actions whether they're small actions or big actions every single day then you're not actively working towards it um and i think another important thing to remember is that any little thing can count right like i think daydreaming is part of our work you know yeah. so we have to sit and we think about it and it's like i might not be actively writing when i'm watching a movie but when i'm watching that movie i'm thinking about it in terms of whatever it is I'm trying to produce. And so, but like, how do we hold ourselves accountable? We need that personal mindset and you need to figure out how to budget that time. There are lots of folks that come up with like good schedules and that works for a lot of people of, okay, between the hours of six 
and nine, this is what I'm doing. If I'm going to watch any TV or hang out after. I'm going to do that after that. Or splitting up your days where, no, you know what? Friday night is date night. And Friday night, it's important to cultivate these relationships, right? Because we are still also living a life um, that's yeah. not just the work that we're trying to produce. And so once you have that full-time job, there's more balancing that needs to be done. Um, but you have to be really intentional with your time. Um, if there's something you want to do, you need to hold yourself accountable to it because no one else is going to hold you accountable. Yeah, dude, I absolutely love that. I, I mean, I echo all of, I echo all of that. I think the two things that I always boil it down to, I, I was actually with this incredible actress, her name's Dream Smith, like two days ago, and she was asking about. I was working this not-for-profit job, DonorsChoose.org, and I was also in this play to kill a mockingbird on Broadway. And she goes, wait, you were working that at the same time? And I was like, yeah, and I didn't think twice. And then she was like, how did you do that? And so she brought it back up yesterday, uh, two days ago, and I'm sitting with her. And I said, I think for me, knowing your why, right? When you understand why you're doing something, it really does change how you prioritize it, how you move around it. Um, and I think, again, I know that it sounds like a little bit of a soapbox, but I think in this era of like social media and so much inundation, like we've forgotten to take time to have whys for the things we do. So it's like, oh, I should go to this happy hour and I need to go to this birthday party and I need to bubble. And there's a lot of like, why? Like if you took a half a second and, and maybe, yeah, some of that is my faith and some of that is just like, I don't know, it's just how I am. It's like, just pause, sip your tea and just be like, wait, why? If I can answer that why, it gives a what to it, it gives a where to it, it gives a how to it, it gives a um, which way to it, um, it gives a with whom to it. So like that has been huge for like being able to juggle. It's like, make sure that everything has a why. And if it doesn't have a why, it's not that the whys have to be profound and deep. Like me and my wife, she's never seen succession and now I'm taking her through it and she is happy. <laughs> we just got to season two and she's having a blast and the why we're watching an episode at night is because it's something that brings her joy it brings me joy to watch her do it and I love the show so yeah I'm gonna burn an hour watching yeah, HBO brilliant. like I could be working on a script who cares my why is that or like oh why am I gonna finish this interview and make sure I go on a walk because it's 84 degrees in New York today you know like so there's a as long as there's a why to what you're doing there's a level of intentionality and then the second thing that I would offer um, that I think we've really lost, uh, and I mean this one very seriously, is uh, the importance of rest. Um, I always speak in the terms of like Sabbath, like that's really important to me, the idea of taking a day of Sabbath, and whether that's a Tuesday, a Saturday, a Sunday, whatever your day is or hours are. And I think that like, that was really scary to embrace. Um, I mean, I went to grad school at NYU, you're living in New York, it's just uh, everything's a hustle and you feel like, if I take a day or two days off, or God forbid, I take a week vacation where I just don't do anything but binge watch, I'm falling behind, or I don't have passion, or I don't really care, or someone else will beat me to it. Like this, this notion of like constantly having to be in output mode. Um, I don't remember which mentor shared that with me, but someone told me that and it really stuck. Like if you're always in output mode, you're never inputting anything to give out. So you start shooting blanks. And that became a real big important practice for me, both as an actor and a writer. And then ironically, it became even more crucial um, as I started producing in the last two years was that no, Saturday evenings are my date night with my wife. So after 4 p.m. on Saturdays, don't hit me up or Sundays are my day of, of worship. And it, you know, it's one of those things that it does take an adjustment and it does mean you might miss a party or a networking event, or, you know, there were days with me and Sean, we were, were in the throes of things. And he's like, I do know that, well, on Sundays, it, Duran's not going to be available. And it might mean that this thing fell behind, but I've learned that what you stand to, what you stand to gain from losing temporarily because you've allowed yourself to input is far greater than what you stand to lose if you continue to just be like onto the next, onto the next. And so also just resting and being unapologetic about saying like, today I'm not doing anything because I need to rest in order for me to pull an all-nighter or do, you know, back-to-back -back projects. And 
I think it's important that people, um, and I always encourage people to not be afraid to actually schedule rest because I think we say rest a lot and then we don't actually put it in the calendar. So it's like, yeah, I'm going to rest. Yeah, I'm going to rest. And then, you know, life. So that's just been, those have been the really two like most important things. I'm still yeah. learning how to rest. <laughs> I yeah. still, yeah. I know, yeah. I know. Both, are, man. Both <laughs> are, man. I'm telling you, like, you'd be surprised. <laughs> like, my God, <laughs> most people are like, it, it cause I, I get, I feel weird about when I do it. Like I said, today is going to be one of those days where it's like, I'm just going to be reading all day. And it's like, I'm going to be done at five and I'm choosing to do, and the whole body's like, yeah, but you could finish this script if you go <laughs> for hours. And then you're like, yeah, but then I didn't rest, you know? It's the guilt that eats away at you, I find. <laughs> That's some very good advice from both of you though. Thank you for that. Excellent. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the distribution of the film, the distribution strategy, and where we can find the film going forward. Shawnee boy, let's fly. So, so right now, um, we don't have a distributor. Um, so we're still doing uh, the festival uh, mm -hmm. circuit. And so we have uh, some really exciting festivals coming up. Um, uh, New York, LA, Germany. Um, and okay. Arkansas and um, so I can't like still they haven't been publicly announced yet so I can't you know go into the any of the specifics of that um, but it's been a very interesting journey with the uh, with distribution and so uh, and I think it gives a lot of clarity into the uh, what the market is uh, right now so making the film and then you hope that it's like, okay, this is like a cool, small, budgeted um, indie movie. Um, and then you think of Clerks, you think of Napoleon Dynamite, right? That's the possibility of, of what could be in terms of like the way a smaller film can really make an impact and get out there in the world. Um, that thing doesn't really happen anymore. And it hasn't happened for, for many years, um, but one still holds out hope for for such a thing. And, it, and when it does happen, it doesn't happen uh, nearly as much as it could. Um, so that's something we always knew going into it would be part of the situation. Um, also, we have amazing actors, but they are not actors that are known, uh, known stars yet, right? Um, and so that's another thing that in the distribution landscape, and it's, it's kind of what it reveals about the distribution landscape is, there's definitely a risk averse, you know, with everything post-industry, uh, a tightening up of everything. And unless something is a feels like it's a sure bet, even though there are no sure bets, but if you know it's like, okay, this movie's got Paul Giamatti in it and um, Channing Tatum, and this could be, you know, even if it doesn't make money, it was a good bet. Right, like we, it's it was a good bet to to put our money into this because there's the possibility of it, and it's a much riskier bet with I see that a Sabona film. Yeah, right. I mean, that'd be that's a great movie. Um, well, I'm depending movie on what movie is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a much it's a much riskier uh, proposition, and now the the money they put into the movies is far less too. So. Think back to Napoleon Dynamite, there was like so much print and advertising campaigns to make that movie once it went into wide release, the movie that it was. And there's a distributor and there we'd had a lot of uh, interest from distributors uh, that were reaching out directly and some like honest, like dream distributors. And um, and then you see some of the movies that they're putting out now where they have these huge stars in the movie and there's no promotion for it. I was like, this is a huge movie. I see it in the bottom of the email. It's like, it's in their email footer. Um, it's like, this is a huge movie that has these two big stars coming out next month. I'm someone that's engaged with what's happening in movie culture. I've never heard of this movie. Um, and so then that's happening too. And then now you think about what a distributor can offer. So then, I mean, there's a lot of facets to this. Um, and Duran and I had had this conversation too, where it's like, well, what do you get from a distributor? And we already had the conversation of, we are not willing to sell what is like essentially my life's work 
for something less than a, a true commitment to the project. There are a lot of people that'll come in with like, okay, here's $20,000 or $30,000 minimum guarantee for the, the full rights for your film. And horror stories of someone selling to HBO and then it's pulled after a year because of a tax write-off. And then that film is stuck with that distributor for seven years until the end of that term. And it's nowhere. And they can't do anything about it. And that's scary to me. Um, and then I had another thought watching watching a movie on streaming. I was watching Freddy Got Fingered, uh, which is a great movie, cinema. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's excellent. It's so good. And um, watching Freddy Got Fingered um, on a streaming service and it just being interrupted with ads at like random times. And I just had this thought. I was like, is this the dream? You know, like there is the dream of like, so you know for what you really want which is like theatrical and like a true commitment but then someone will come in and be like oh yeah we'll get it on like this streaming service and that alone is not what this was all about um just to like you know, be like okay cool like this is great and then now we sold it to this distributor and it's on amazon prime now and then that's that and you kind of move on um so i'm definitely interested in exploring i mean there's still this year there's so much left to it and so much that can happen but we're very much in sort of discussion of what are the alternative ways of doing it and there are other filmmakers i met at south by southwest that i've been exploring certain ideas of what does it mean to go on tour with a movie what does it mean to set up your own way of distributing because ultimately what's important is getting your movie out in front of audiences having people see the movie that's the most important thing and i've heard so many great success stories of yeah we went on tour and we were doing this and then they kept extending it because people kept coming in and it's like right like that's really cool and you could sell to a distributor that's just going to drop it on a streaming service and put in none of that work and so Those are the kind of things that we're thinking about as, as it relates to distribution, how we're approaching it. Um, and also just like Duran said, knowing your why, it's like, why are we doing this, right? It's not about just saying yes to something. It's about saying, okay, we are doing this because they are committing to something that's going to benefit the lo longevity of a project and the, the full life cycle of what this could be. Um, So that's kind of where we're at with distribution. So there's still people that we are talking to, waiting to hear back from. We do not have a sales agent. Um, and so at the moment we are doing everything on our own. And it's the same conversation with sales agents where they love the movie, but ultimately because it doesn't have the stars, they are not taking on projects that they just love. They have to take on projects. And we've heard from them too. It's like, I'm representing some projects that I don't even really care about but it's a project that i have feel like there's a strong chance that we'd be able to sell it to some of the partners that we work with so i don't know there's so much like reality check uh of like what really is the state and there's the dream of like it going back to a time where things like that were happening and that's not really the case and we knew that going into it and so now really thinking of what is the strategy and that strategy is constantly evolving because it's still very much like this is the beginning of it's film being out into the world life cycle and so we don't need to make that decision today and that decision might come in september um it might come in december um and so that's those are the things that are on our mind as we are constantly reevaluating and thinking about what our strategy is so I, I... from sorry go on were you going to say no, something no, gonna say. No. Oh, i was just going to say so from the experience that you've been through and what you've learned Um, would you change anything with your next project? Yeah, yes. Um, hmm. But what exactly I think is dependent on the project. You know, there's a project Duran and I are talking about that we want to do as a comedy. That's, uh, you know, that's going to be like, yeah, if we have some, another actor that's in it, like that's uh, uh, a star in some way. And it's like that, could be cool and that could make sense for like that kind of project but the project that I want to do about um, my relationship with my mom I'm thinking of much more in like a Ben and Suzanne way right like that's a personal project and so I think like it, it is project specific how you'd want to approach certain things and I'm sure it's like everything it's like you know going every film is its own unique organism and uh, we learned a lot you know this was 
for both of us our first feature film so it was a it was and it's similar to short films and there are a lot of things that are very different from making short films and so um there's a lot that we learned along the way of just like how we could approach things a little bit differently doing it again um from like pre-production side of things to the post side of things or festival side of things um press side of things but um Yeah, I don't know. I think it's I think it, there's still something that's very project dependent. It depends on the kind of thing that you want to do. And then then knowing what that is and aiming for like that scope. So, OK, this buddy comedy that we want to do, that's like adult super bad. You know, that maybe would be a budget level of this. And if we're able to attach this person, then it could be this. And that's maybe the way to go. And so. working within the system in a certain way. And then what are the things that you do? That's like, okay, this is another film that's being made outside of the system. Um, so the, yeah, that's, those are my thoughts on it. Jerome. Yeah, I mean, I think it was, um, this is when I'll give you, I'll give you this one, Amber, for free. Because uh, it, But this notion, one of the chapters in the book is called Failure is Fertilizer. Um, so that's like a phrase that like exists between me and my wife. It's something that like all, you know, all failure smells like shit, but uh, all shit is necessary <laughs> for, you know, your soil to grow. And so I like that I, already. Yeah. Yeah. So I never, so I never, I try never to look at any uh, thing that's like, oh, I wish I had this, but it didn't happen that way as like a setback as much as like, oh, that's good, useful information. Like this was really good fertilizer. Um, it's allowed for both of us to continue to grow in our respective careers, um, but it also is revealed areas where, like Sean so eloquently said, there were things that, you know, in choosing to make the movie we chose to make. we knew certain things going in. So it was one of those things where it was like, we're either gonna be pleasantly surprised that what we think is happening on the inside of the system, uh, we're either gonna be pleasantly surprised that like, oh my God, we're actually wrong. Or we're gonna be like, oh my gosh, I guess we were really right. Um, and the difference is now you can feel more informed. And so I left the pro, I left that, ex I've left this experience or like going forward Being like, absolutely, there are definitely things that I've, you know, I've already considered on these next two features that I've got um, on my slate as a company, um, one of which I'm super excited about. And, you know, some of the factors of like, oh, this is how distribution companies talk or, oh, this is how sales agent speaks are things that like you're not going to know until you're actually doing it. And the thing that I loved about the approach that we took because the movie is so good, as I always reminded Sean, it's like, because the movie resonated with every person it's watching and people actually find it to be a good movie, it kind of opened the door to a level of transparent conversation that quite frankly, if our movie had been really, you know, crap um, and like very mediocre and like very, whatever, you know, it would have been very easy for people to not let, give us that level of transparency. We would just you know, would have been no responses or, you know, fake answers. And I think because we were able to get so much great insight as a producer, I know it's definitely shifted how I look at like, okay, what is my greater goal for each project? So yeah, case by case is important, but I don't know. I, I've been thinking about this for the last like couple of months, um, especially as I've gone on to these, these other projects that I'm adding to the slate that like, I, I, I do really believe that like, if you build it, they will come. And that um, I'm not interested in catching trends. I'm interested in, you know, building legacies. And so there is a part of it that's like reactive. And I think that, I don't know, too much of this industry is reactive. And I think people overreact to the trends of now. And I think for the last 12 years, uh, going on 13 years now, the streaming war and the way that uh, video on demand shifted the climate uh has resulted in you know never before seen dual strikes in our country or you know conversations about what just like ai and so there's this oh we're just now seeing things that were a problem 10 years ago um kind of now bubble to the surface and in many ways yeah like i might i might be more open to like ooh, if i could cast this person in this role because they're a name today it may have a better shot at selling at this company or this distributor picking it up but i think that i would argue and i would love to hear comments from your listeners that like i think we're 
I think the days of a hundred million dollar movie, not putting any money into marketing because we have 10 stars on it, it'll just work. Those days are kind of dying and they're dying really quickly. And so the last thing I want to do is be a young producer with a vision, really talented people in my network and be like, okay, how quickly can, well, this is what, you know, this is what Hulu needs. This is what uh, Netflix desires. Like, this is what we're doing right now. Get up, get on board as opposed to like, I think in the next five years, especially with AI, this whole idea of self-generated marketing, um, which is what we really can call it when you don't spend any money on trying to get the film seen, you just, you know, I, I, there are a couple of films that I won't name them, but I was meeting with a couple of producers and asking people, hey, did you see that movie with this actress? And the amount of people who have said, oh no, I never saw it, but I heard it was good. Like we live in that era and like, so I'm, more interested in being like yeah i may adapt a little bit but i'm not gonna lie to you like i'm game i want to make movies like this and i want to challenge the industry to realize that this is both financially smarter and more efficient um uh proactively diverse and more engaging um expands the wealth and reach of people you know people like my father who's a 21 year military vet being interested in going to the movies because of a film like this versus I don't really want to watch another reboot of blank, right? Like I'm, I am I think about target demographics, Gen Z, who's very, very, you know, bored with the oversaturated CGI Marvel movie, whatever. Um, I'm like, I'm more interested in, again, I, I like building legacies. I don't really care to follow trends because trends will pass, but you know, at the end of the day, a good story with an authentic, like I like, I said this to Sean when I first met him, like I'm in the, I'm in the business of making stars. I'm not in the business of catching stars because like Satya is going to be a star. Like the industry is just catching up to South Asian artists being like A-listers. Like they're, we're at the beginnings of that. And I'm like, I'm interested in showing people hey, this is actually, the, this writer, director, Sean Sinovratny is is the next. Like, I'm more interested in showing them that than being like, oh, how quickly can I, you know, climb on the, the latest express train? Because reality is that gas is really expensive, you know? And I also, once you, you. If, yeah. if you're that. always trying to ch uh, chase trends, then you're always behind because of how long it takes to even make the movie. Yeah. So then it's always playing catch up. So you're, it's, and it, again, it, it's so reactive. Yeah. So, but that's, that is kind of definitely a, a part, of the, part of the industry. And it's a choice. You yeah. Know, I know that we're going back and forth, but like, you know, to any listener out there, like uh, you have to consider the cost, like everything that I just said, it's like, yeah, that sounds dope. That sounds great. And I'm also choosing the cost that like, oh, mm. my, every third movie I make might not actually be on HBO. Like I have to be willing to be like, oh, you're in, you might not have 1.5 Instagram, million Instagram followers. Like you have to like, and I think that that's where sometimes in these dialogues, like we say all these great things, but then we forget like there was a cost to that too. Cause the reality is, yeah, like Ben and Suzanne is such a great script that we could have gone to between the network that I have, the network that he has, and the fact that we were in, we had an interim agreement and we're in the middle of a strike, like actors just wanting to work. We could have gone to a plethora of people and played that game. And, you know, and again, there's no judgment to that side of it too. It's just like, sometimes I think we, we don't realize that like, no, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And so you just have to be game with the choice you're choosing and like, don't be upset when, you know, the chips fall as they may. So for me, it's like, I, I would rather a world where I can afford to take my wife on a great trip. The films that I'm making are fruit based. And every time someone watches the film, they go, wow, wow, they don't make movies like this anymore. This is great. Like, and then I, you know, can I afford a cup of tea and like, <laughs> can I live my life? Like that's, that for me is much more interesting than being on TMZ or having mm. to tone for my second $100 million flop or how quickly can I pull from the 90s uh, reboot station as opposed to like, yeah, look, I read this. There's a couple of books that I'm looking to IP now and there are books that, you know, 90% of people have never heard of, but I'm like, I would much rather put 
you know, $2.5 million into making this book or $500,000 into making this book into a movie and then going to an industry and saying, look, Netflix, you spend $10 million on new projects that go to your your platform and then they flop because subscription-based models of filmmaking is not really moving the needle for you. I'll make you something for $500,000 that people will actually enjoy, build stars out of it, and in exchange, sell it to you for a mil. You've just cut $9 million off your margins. I just doubled my investment. Say la, let's move on. You know, like it's very, uh, it's very Court Jefferson's instead of doing $100 million movies, let's do 10, $10 million. And I think that that really is where we're going. And I just want to encourage, uh, just before we end, I just really do want to encourage any listeners out there that like, if you've got a really great story, because we have the means these days, like make the thing and then deal with the industry BS. Like it, it, you will spend 10 years talking about how I need to wait for, oh, I got to get a million dollars to make this movie. Oh, I've got to wait till this, you know, million follower Instagram person is game to do my movie in order to make my movie. Meanwhile, you had two classmates who were really talented that you believed in, you know? Um, I just challenge them, make, make the thing and then figure out like what you want to do with it because you'll be pleasantly surprised how one good the thing is, two, how much you've learned and three stars today might be uh, fallen tomorrow. And so, yeah, that's, those are the last things I just really needed to get out of. <laughs> well said. Yeah. Um, so tell us what is next. Tell us about your slate. What's next in your slate? Yeah, well, uh, I'm married. So part of my slate is just being a husband for a while. <laughs> um, we just recently got married uh, back in August of last year. And so there's been a lot Congratulations. of- Congratulations. Thank you so much. It has been a lot of, hey, babe, I'm going to make bread at the house. But uh, from an industry <laughs> from an industry standpoint, um, I do have uh, two movies that are currently in production or pre-production. One is called Brink. Uh, it's an incredible two-hander. Um, if Ben and Suzanne is a romantic comedy, this puppy is a romantic drama. Um, it's a, but it, it's a really touching story. Really talented actor, Alex Hurt, uh, is going to play our lead. And it takes place upstate New York. And it's really about what it means to be on the brink of, you know, dying trends versus new possibilities. Um, and then the second project I'm also so excited about um, there's this uh, incredible writer director named Virginia Tucker. Uh, she wrote a piece called A Little Cracked. And it is a story about a like survivor story, um, comedy about PTSD and sexual awareness. And what does it mean for Gen Z as a culture to navigate things that we often don't talk about until we're in our 50s. And so um, the film is about, you know, the culture of what it means for you to heal and recover after an experience like that happens to you. Um, and so those are those are two projects that are currently kind of churning. One of them I think will be in production in the fall, which is really exciting. Uh, and then I'm also an actor. And so there's that like awkward turtle where, <laughs> where it's like, oh yeah, and I'll, I'll start rehearsals and really diving into Our Town with Kenny Leon on Broadway this fall uh, going into winter. So. It'll be Jim Parsons from The Big Bang Theory, Katie Holmes, and a really great crew of people. And so excited to get back to work. Yeah, they sound very interesting. Brilliant. How exciting. Yeah. That's a lot of juggling. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm like I said, I'm going to get off this call, have some tea, finish baking this bread, go on a walk, just pray a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> tonight, you know, God speak. Uh, Sean, what next? Just before we go. Yeah. So, um, right now, I it's kind of crazy because this is this movie was like the only dream of my adult life, right? Like, you know, working towards it for fourteen years, and now there's this like incredibly freeing feeling of like, whoa, this is wild. Like, I I did the one thing I wanted to do, and so what's next? And so now I'm like developing 
kind of simultaneously a bunch of different projects. And so what I'm interested in exploring is like my take on like certain specific things. So I'm not like trying, like the next movie is not a romantic comedy, um, but I think it's going to have the same tone of uh, Ben and Suzanne, right? Because that's my, the way I'm seeing the world and my, my approach to things. So um, there's a horror film that I'm developing, which is uh, a slasher, like a throwback slasher that's about making a movie so it's very much about being behind the scenes of making a movie and the stress that comes with making that movie tied with a slasher um there's a story i want to tell about um uh before my mom had passed like my take on the child taking care of their ailing parent uh half taking place in las vegas half taking place in sri lanka and that one feels like sort of like in that ben and suzanne model of things um There's a TV show that uh, Sathya and I had been developing for a long time called Teenage Spaceship, um, which is a teen coming of age show very much in the vein of Freaks and Geeks about a brown kid that discovers subculture like, you know, punk, emo, underground subculture. Um, there's a documentary that um, I'm in development on and working on with um, Ben Barnett, who is uh, the singer and songwriter of a group called Kind of Like Spitting. He's essentially my um, Elliot Smith, um, but also it's very much revolves around not just band stuff. It's not really a music documentary, but it's also about mental health and it's about depression. And um, there's the buddy comedy uh, working on with Sathya as well. So right now it's like, oh my God. And like, then I have this other idea. I'm like, oh, I'm adding that to the slate too. So Right now, now it's going to be another 14 years of simultaneously developing all of these projects and then seeing which one is going to be the first because I'm excited about all of them. Like, depending on the day, I'm like, okay, today I want to write notes for uh, the story about my mom. And I start working on that. And the next day, it's like, oh, I have some really cool horror ideas. So, right now, it's um, the, the freedom is there and I'm developing everything. And at some point, probably in a few months, I will nail down okay what is going to be the focus for the next thing you know just because something needs to take a priority um for it to be actualized otherwise they're all just things that exist in the ether but it's kind of crazy how now there is like a total open slate that opened up after making this movie because everything was so geared to this for so long and now it's just like i can do this or i can do this and um it's it's very exciting and i feel like artistically juiced up in a totally different way from the Ben and Suzanne era, uh, as I can call it. Yeah. That's brilliant. Heaps of ideas. The ideas yeah. book is full. That's brilliant. Yes. <laughs> I love it. This has been amazing. I've really enjoyed it. And I know the audience will too. So that was really fascinating. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I absolutely loved it. Um, I hope you've enjoyed yourselves too. And I wish you it's all been the a best great conversation. with your future endeavours. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Can't wait to hear the, the published episode. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Please consider supporting us on Patreon. Your support not only helps us keep the show running, but also unlocks exclusive premium content just for our cherished subscribers. You can head to our Patreon page now, either through our website, whirlywebproductions.com forward slash podcast or through our Instagram at Film Finance Podcast and follow the link in the bio.